Oh, this week on Cracked Science, is our children learning or is our children paying a price by spending so much time in front of screens? Hey, this is Jonathan Jerry, and you're watching Cracked Science, the show from the McGill Office for Science and Society that separates sense from nonsense on the scientific stage. Screens. We've gone from competing over who has the biggest flat screen television to watching action flicks on a 4x2 smartphone. Is that progress? Not only have many screens gotten smaller, they've become more ubiquitous. And the media has not shied away from reminding us that they may pose a threat to our most precious resource, our children. Screen addicts, put down the tablet, too much screen use really might change your kid's brain, and a whole slew of other scary headlines, including do not let children take electronic devices into bedrooms, and my personal favorite, what happens if my child looks at a screen? As Nietzsche taught us, the screen also gazes into you. First things first, I will put aside questions of how social media affects the mental health of teenagers and the whole phenomenon of cyberbullying, which merit their own video. Parents care a great deal about how much time their kids spend in front of screens. Screen time is, according to a study, Australian parents' number one concern regarding their kids' health. And they've got scorpions the size of large shoes. I know they're fairly harmless, but large shoes. The alarming headlines I showed you did not appear out of nowhere. They are reporting on scientific studies that have measured the impact of screen time on the physical health of children and adolescents. And if we follow the breadcrumbs to these studies, the situation appears pretty grim, with scientists writing that basically the evidence suggests that screen time has a negative effect on a number of health measurements in children and teenagers, things like obesity, fitness, quality of life, self-esteem, how well they perform in school, etc. Should we be worried? To answer this question, I will ask one to you, and I, I need you to concentrate for this and think of the right answer. During an ordinary weekday, how many hours do you spend watching television, using the computer, or playing video games? I'll give you five seconds to answer. Tough, isn't it? That same question was the one that was asked of 66,000 teenagers as part of a Brazilian study on screen time. That is how screen time was assessed. And this study is not the only one. The vast majority of the research on screen time relies on questionnaires, often with a single question. How much time would you say you or your kids spend staring at screens during a typical day? Questionnaires are used a lot in psychosocial research because they are easy. But questionnaires are not always very reliable. You just experienced it yourself. Can you accurately recall and give a number to how much time you typically spend looking at a screen every day? It's really hard to do, and I see no reason why study participants would be better at it than we are. One study on screen time tells us that some children report implausibly high amounts of daily screen time, for example, 13 and a half hours per day, that if true would leave little time for school, sleep, or other daily activities. Not only is it hard to remember accurately, but we may want to please the researcher. Health studies are particularly prone to this. If I enroll you in a study looking at whether or not fruit consumption is linked to your risk of developing gurglish syndrome, and I ask you, so how many fruits do you eat in a day? You might be tempted to tell me you eat more fruits than you really do because there's a health halo around them and you want to be perceived as healthier than you are, as someone who makes good decisions about what they eat. You want to airbrush your responses. In fact, this effect is so well known, Statistics Canada has correction equations for anybody doing research on obesity based on questionnaires. Basically, people say they're taller and leaner than they really are, and we know by how much on average. People lie. A better way to monitor screen time would be to use tracking devices and background apps to objectively measure this. But research can be slow and technology moves fast, so researchers are still playing catch up. For example, you may say you spend three hours in front of a TV every day and you use your phone for five hours, but some of these hours can overlap. It's called screen stacking, better known as the, oh my god, I love shows about serial killers, but that scene in Mindhunter is really dragging, let me check what's happening on Twitter phenomenon. Another problem with studies on screen time is what we call confounders. If, let's say, spending a lot of time looking at screens were to be associated with more heart problems. 
And if we could be certain that screen time causes the heart problems, and we can't in these types of studies, but let's pretend. Is it the screen itself that is causing this? Is there something specific to the, the screen, whether it's the reading distance or the light that emanates from it or the type of content we consume on it? Is that what's causing this? Or is it that we're sitting down? Is it that we're not outside playing sports? Is there something specific about these screens that we should worry about? Or is it just that old nugget that we are becoming more and more sedentary and we need to move more? But you say, Anderson Cooper himself told me that screens are changing our brains. And Anderson Cooper is America's darling. 60 Minutes profiled researchers at the National Institute of Health who found proof that increased screen time is impacting brain development. The NIH revealed these brain scans of 9 and 10 year olds. The red charts show premature thinning of the cortex in children who spend a lot of time looking at screens. The cortex processes information from the five senses. Should parents be concerned by that? We don't know if it's being caused by the screen time. We don't know yet if it's a bad thing. Last December, Anderson Cooper did a segment on 60 Minutes on a, quote, groundbreaking study following 11,000 kids for a decade and doing scans of their brains. And the researchers found, as you saw, that in some of the kids, they see what appears to be a premature thinning of the cortex. And Dr. Dowling was quick to point out that they don't know if it's being caused by the screen time or even if it's a bad thing. Here's what's going on. As a colleague of mine put it, Everyone is rushing to peek at the presents under the tree the night before Christmas. Except it's not the night before Christmas, it's the decade before Christmas. We have a problem in science right now, which is that we love preliminary results. We publish them, we talk about them at conferences, we get the media to write about them, but they are preliminary. This study has just started. When the 60 Minutes piece came out, they had just completed enrolling their participants and had generated baseline data. This is like filling out your bio on Tinder and getting a match and trying to predict what this may mean to your relationship 10 years down the road. We don't know what these brain changes mean. We don't know that they apply to everyone who spends a lot of time looking at screens. We don't know if these changes are bad or good or neutral. We need to wait before we jump to conclusions. Look. I don't want to trivialize the issue. We know that the companies making tech gadgets and online platforms are tweaking them to keep us essentially hooked on them. Billions of dollars are going into creating the perfect virtual candy. We also know that the light and the intellectual stimulation that comes with looking at a screen before bedtime, that that can make it harder to fall asleep. So that's another concern. Then there's the positive link to myopia. Another bevy of headlines inform us that spending too much time looking at screens up close may be an important cause of this explosion in myopia we're seeing in children. Screenagers, yeah, I know, good one. A big risk factor, though, is actually genetics. If your parents are nearsighted, you have a higher chance of being the same way. But some argue that genetics aren't enough to explain this rapid increase in numbers. But here again, while screens are a plausible boogeyman, no one that I could see has shown causation. We suspect, but we can't prove. So, given the fact that so many studies on screen time rely on flawed questionnaires, and given the fact that this NIH-funded study Anderson Cooper reported on is nowhere near completed, we may not know for a few more decades the actual impact of screen time on human development. Are we in the midst of a moral panic? If so, there's precedent. Officials say they are responding to complaints from parents that children have skipped school or stolen money to play the games and made a nuisance of themselves. Those little scoundrels making a nuisance of themselves. New technology always brings with it concerns that it's frying our brains and dumbing us down. Many will argue that tablets and smartphones are simply unprecedented in their influence, but again, the ways in which we've studied this potential influence are deeply flawed. Screens may be a net good, they may be a net bad, they may be a Netflix, or they may be, as so many things turn out to be, a mix of both. Use them in moderation, and don't forget to get off the couch. I briefly alluded to video games, so of course your mind went to, aren't violent video games causing children to commit acts of violence in real life? And with a new Mortal Kombat coming out in a month, I would refer you to a short piece in The Conversation by Professor Christopher J. Ferguson entitled, It's Time to End the Debate About Video Games and Violence. 
In it, he argues that editorial biases, professional groups, and bad scientific methods are responsible for the skewed perception we have on video games and violence. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, do click that button and ring that bell to get notifications. Don't forget to join the thousands of people who subscribe to our weekly newsletter by going to mcgill.ca slash OSS. In the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Cracked Science and join us next time for science that may or may not be all it's cracked up to be.